Welcome to this webinar, What Do Higher Education Estates Look Like in a Post-COVID World? I am Thomas Lane, the technical editor of Building Magazine. The higher education sector has changed beyond all recognition over the last two years. Online learning has become the norm during the pandemic, and since then, hybrid working has become firmly established. In this session, our panel will examine how higher education estates can deliver what both staff and students need in this post-pandemic world. They will also discuss the impacts of meeting net zero goals and how existing campuses can be reworked to meet these challenges. So I'm joined today by a panel of experts, um, Matt Cartwright, who is a director at 12 Architects, Mark Evans, director at Director of Architecture at Broadway Mallion, another architect, and Helen Groves, the Head of Education at Atkins. So the format of today's session is each panellist will speak for about eight to ten minutes and then once the formal presentations are over we will have a panel discussion and um, take questions from you. So if you want to submit a question to, on, on this topic to um, our panel please um, use the um, tool on your on your browser to do so. So in terms of what people are going to say, Matt will speak first and discuss how the pandemic has changed the way space is utilised and what the impact of tight budgets and the net zero agenda is having on how existing buildings are repurposed. Mark will give an overview of the impacts of the pandemic and how this has reduced the amount of space needed by universities and how this surplus space can be now repurposed to suit the brave new world we're in. And then finally, Helen will talk about how technology allows a better understanding of changing needs and the approaches to, to decision making when it comes to making this how you're going to actually adopt these spaces um, for the changes. So um, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matt. So thanks very much, Matt. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to join the panel today. Um, so uh, we're working with a number of universities at the moment, uh, currently uh, uh, with the University of Sheffield, and we're on UCL's framework, and we're working on a number of projects on the Bloomsbury campus. Um, I think as an introduction, um, it's really important to state that every university has their own unique environment, and there is no one blueprint for the design or the solution for all universities, um, and therefore you've got to really consider the, the context and the type setting and structure of the universities that we're working with. Um, I've, I've listed out kind of five key points to consider. Um, and number one is probably fairly obvious, uh, but that's student experience. And I think pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the student experience is absolutely fundamental to the success of any university. Um, I think clearly the pandemic has, as Thomas outlined, changed the ways that learning is happening and research is happening and how uh, academics are working within universities. But I think the student experience needs to be focused around personal choice. Um, the pandemic has, uh, not just within the higher education sector, but also within other sectors, brought to the forefront the access to good quality external space and making sure that spaces can be used in a number of different ways. Clearly, the second point is sustainability. And you know, universities, again, have a range of estates of different ages, some new, some old. Um, but I think one of the kind of key uh, areas that we've certainly seen in our work is the question of new build versus uh, reuse or adaptation of existing buildings. Um, and I think it's not just about thinking about new buildings and how do we make the new buildings work well, but it's equally as if not more important to think about the existing estate. Often it's in a fairly poor state. It's been built at a time where the environmental agenda wasn't there. And therefore, uh, a lot of our work now is looking at reuse of existing buildings. And I can come on to that in more detail, uh, perhaps in the questions and answers. Um, the third uh, topic I'd like to just highlight is utilization. And particularly within the teaching environment, 
utilization has been historically and typically very poor with low utilization of buildings. Um, and this often focuses around um, buildings that have been built or designed or used for individual uh, uh, topics, subjects, departments, even faculties. And I think through our work, even before the pandemic, certainly post pandemic, it's looking at how do you now create facilities which are used by multiple subjects and how can they be developed so that you can have different subjects um, being taught at the same time uh, or um, in sequential periods throughout the week. And if you can do that, then you can make the buildings more efficient in their use, which potentially means you then don't need as many buildings. And then the energy that you're putting into the use of those buildings is focused onto a smaller estate, uh, which helps then on the bigger agenda of space need and energy use. Linked very closely to utilization is flexibility. And I think this is always a, um, a battle between uh, flexible space and specialist space. Um, and what we've seen particularly recently is the coming together of teaching spaces um, with larger cohorts, um, which can be used um, typically, uh, we've seen uh, certainly laboratories now being designed for up to 300 people but are also able to be designed and, and used by smaller groups. So you can have multiple uh, classes going on within one space, um, which I think is a really interesting change uh, within, the, within the sector. And I guess the last um, point is cost and value. I think pre-pandemic, the capital pipeline, the budgets that universities were working with were often you know, billions of pounds, certainly hundreds of millions. And I think in many universities now, the capital pipeline is much smaller. People are needing to think much harder about where do they spend money. But it really needs to go back to the first question about student experience. And that hasn't gone away. So therefore, how do universities create the value for their students, but with a budget that they can afford. And I think over the next few years, we're going to be seeing tighter budgets um, within potentially smaller projects um, and a lot of reuse of existing buildings and flexibility, which has always been high on the agenda, but I think it really will be high on the agenda now, that then ultimately leads to an amazing student experience. So. My five are student experience, sustainability, utilization, flexibility, and cost and value. And I'm happy to pick up any points in the Q&A at the end. So I'll hand back to Thomas uh, now. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks very much, Matt. And just before we move on to um, our next speaker, who's Mark, um, I just also ask you one question. So when I mean, you said at the beginning that, um, you know, the, the needs of so the sort of student body really depends upon the um, sort of different types of university. I mean, have you detected any trends at all in the work that you do? What, what sort of institutions are, what the differences are? So I think um, if you talk about sort of context, I mean, in simple terms, you know, is it a campus university um, in a pure sense, something like, you know, University of Surrey, um, or is it more of an urban campus like UCL or University of Sheffield uh, or MMU or, um, and therefore, you have a series of buildings that sit within an urban setting, which has a kind of wider implication on the campus. Um, and I think, in a simple terms, that's one that's one example. Um, I think uh, accommodation and um, how and where student accommodation is, and historically, um, universities would provide their own accommodation. Now, if you look across the sector, there's far more private. Um, uh, organizations or private companies which are now providing student accommodation which has brought um, a different dynamic to the market um, but I think the pandemic um, has really changed uh, how people want to live and work and how you then create that hybrid learning I mean we're seeing now a lot of students going back into physical environments to be taught within um, but there is still hybrid learning going on 
Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Matt. Um, so we'll now move on to uh, Mark, um, who is, is, is going to, um, to again, give an architect's perspective on the changes. So thanks very much, Mark. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll just do this to the share screen. Um, well, I hope everyone can see that. Um, yep. Hello, everybody. Um, obviously, this is me. Hi, my name is Mark Evans. I'm an architect with uh, the Architects Board of Malian. Um, I specialise in, in our education sector and work with our, with our teams to work with a number of universities up and down up and down the land. So what I'm, what I'm doing here with this presentation is just sort of bringing together some of the trends and some of the experiences that we've we've been doing not only during the pandemic but but coming out of the pandemic in the post pandemic recovery just to to see how how things are evolving really there's my contact details if anyone wants to reach out and contact me after the event by all means do so and i can uh, uh, pick that up later on um it's an interesting topic and it's a very broad topic obviously we're coming out of covid and, and the pandemic now so it's how the the higher education university estates campus is going to look in, 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 in the post-COVID world, really. Um, just going back in time a little, a bit of an introduction. Obviously, Gordon Man has a is a big multinational um, design practice, and we've got studios all over the world. So, from our personal experience, going back a bit in Christmas 2019, our Shanghai studio were getting obviously wind of something brewing, if you like. Obviously, it, it sort of was starting in 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 China back 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 then, and concern was building I think over here it was a it was a topic of conversation um, but but no more than that really however quickly escalated I think in January coming back after Christmas China started entering lockdowns um, so our Shanghai colleagues suddenly had to work from home so as a business architectural business we had to quickly mobilize a, a working from home technology um, which which you know we, it was a rapid um, a process but but we, we managed to make it work um, and it wasn't long after before the UK entered the same sort of scenario, really. So that dark day, end of March, when Boris announced the, the lockdown, we, we as a country um, took that huge step of working from home, where, if you could. Um, we thought this might be a temporary thing, but it was quite clear moving forward that the COVID was, was here, certainly for the foreseeable future. So we had to take more medium to long term plans on how we we could survive as, as a business, but as, but as a country, really. So um, it was surreal times. You know, images speak a thousand words, but you know, considering we're in a modern industrialized uh, country, you know, the, these are sort of images you see in a Hollywood sci-fi film, not not in real life. Um, and literally overnight, you know, we're, we're one of the oldest democracies in the world, and we've been asked or ordered to to change how we how we live, um, literally overnight. Um, suddenly the working from home idea was 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 real <laughs> um i think this is the i love this image this is the fantasy dream um of what we all think working from home or working remotely can can be and indeed it can be for for some but if you're a key worker or if you're a teacher or a student i think the reality is somewhat different um i think in the higher education sector specifically you know that it was incredibly hard for or being a student going into that 2020 year. I think certainly first year students particularly, um, it wasn't the experience they signed up for really. And it was a very different, um, um, let's say experience and ideal really. So it's a big of student students um, experience that, that Matt talked about earlier. <laughs> this was not part of the prospectus or brochure really. Um, I think the knock on effect for everybody was the pandemic pr pr basically gave, a, us all that kick in, in in the backside to to push us much more towards a, a, a transition of using digital tools um, on how we can continue our daily lives but continue doing doing what we wanted to do it wasn't perfect and in the early days there was a few tweaks but but it generally worked in 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 in, in, in generally talking to each other and, and going forward and suddenly we're into the world of teams zoom blue jeans how do I share my screen? Oops, I'm stuck on mute. And you know, there's some good old-fashioned British humour and good old parish council meetings that hit the headlines on. You know, life went on, albeit in a different sort of ilk. Um, I think for teachers, learners, and creators looking at the higher education sort of sector specifically, it wasn't ideal. Um, as I say, if you're a first-year student coming into into this environment. Um, it's not what you signed up for, really. And to pick Matt's point, I, the, the student experience was, was hit very, very hard. Um, universities rapidly transitioned towards a, a 
using technology to, to continue their, their, their core business. Um, but but it was it was still a very different scenario, and students were you know, effectively locked up in, in, in solitary confinement per se. And you were doing a digital silo effectively, whether wherever you were, whether you were stuck in your parents' home, halls, and or, or apartments, and so on. Um, I think the, the the communication, the digital communication tools, um, worked to talk to people. But what it didn't do, and the big knock-on effect, I think, for um, higher education was it just didn't or it removed any direct social contact, that social interaction, um, or the ability to collaborate and learn together. You know, we're human beings, we, we, that's what, what we, we want to do. Um, and a lot of the, the unacademic reasons that you go to university were just, were just you know, not possible. You know, you go to university to leave home for the first time, you, you want to make a whole new friend network, you, you want to evolve yourself as, as an independent adult, you know, this is who you're going to become. And, and as well as just experiencing that campus lifestyle um, and the city that the university is in, you know, just trying something new. You don't get that from teams in your, in your bed sit bedroom. Um, as we're coming out of COVID, obviously the evidence is, is starting to um, sort of enforce, sort of reinforce what we what we suspected at the time. But one of the big hits was was student well-being and, and staff well-being and, and human well-being. You know, so the, the data is, is is clearly sort of pushing towards that it, it, it it's really impacted our mental health and I think the repercussions certainly in education are still really to be to be seen you know it's, it's still filtering through um I think post-covid now we're coming back into um sort of the, the, the recovery plan as I've sort of built this you know social distancing has either gone completely or it's certainly been been phased out um and I think you know lo looking at the estate moving forward it, it's it's a <laughs> It started to make us very, uh, very obvious to see what sort of spaces that were at the time deemed essential, but now through technology and using technological communication, suddenly these essential spaces are, are not as essential. In some cases, probably not even used anymore. So your uh, sort of the list of the sort of more traditional sort of spaces on a university estate, whether it's the staff office, the staff base, more conventional classrooms or large lecture theatres. And I love the picture of, of, of the professor lab um, and his lab space or lab office. Um, suddenly, what, what wasn't enough space is, is now actually an abundance and an underutilised space. So I think there's a huge shift now we're seeing of, OK, then you went from pre-pandemic where universities didn't have enough space and they were rapidly trying to expand and, and build new or repurpose old buildings into more flexible to, to, to cater for expanding need, suddenly we're starting to see estates that, that have potentially an abundance of space. You know, there's a lot of space that's very early underutilized. So we need to do something better with that. Um, I think what, I've, what I'm starting to see is, is, is a cluster of, of, of the post-COVID sort of evolution of where those, that, those spaces could be repurposed. And I think Matt touched on it earlier, it's, it's using spaces more flexibly. I say we've done a, a one of these laboratories that has 250 students in it that can be divided down into smaller lessons independently using technology cleverly. So using existing space is more, far more flexible and, and exciting. But actually these are the core um, facilities of what the university is offering. It's the core business. Um, it's why students want to come to that particular university. Um, and it, when they're learning, it, it, it it's, it's those simulation spaces, that's those research laboratory spaces that you cannot do on teams. You need to roll your sleeves up, get in and, and get hands dirty to learn by doing, learn by experimenting, learning by collaboration. These are the engine room spaces. So I think there's a big drive now to not only expand and increase these number of specialist facilities, specialist labs, um, to make that core offer far more enticing for that particular university as well as linking to a much better student experience once they go to that particular university. Um, I think the other thing we've started to see is the, the your good old-fashioned classroom or seminar room had started to, to go towards a more sort of hybrid model with, with and, and layouts with clustered furniture to, to give you a variety of different teaching modes but I think one thing that came out of, or during the, the pandemic and, and moving and pre-pandemic there's still i think a, a, a bit of a disjoint between a proper seamless hybrid integration so whether you're in person in that classroom or, or dialing in remotely 
it, we, we've got to push the technology and the design of those rooms to be much more seamless, I think. So people aren't feeling that they've got the short end of the stick, whether they're online or whether they're in person. I think there's a, there's, there's, there's a bit of work to be done, I think, to, to sort of push that digital hybrid classroom even further and really make it an immersive, exciting, seamless experience, regardless of where you are. Um, I think the other one is you know, coming back down to student experience particularly, but you've, if you've got a, a campus with lots of specialist spaces around, those are the engine room. I think when students come out of those, linking back to the sort of sticky campus idea, students are buzzing, they want to talk about what they've just learned or done, continue that collaboration rather than sort of uh, sort of finding not very nice spaces on the rest of the campus. Let's reutilize the old staff offices, the old corridors, the, the old classes into much more exciting, flexible, open, dynamic hubs, neighborhoods. You know, let's make them little little dens and places where students can can congregate, do quiet study, collaborative thought. They're fully technologically plugged in, so you've got wireless, seamless connections and so on, but it's it's creating little work settings and collaboration settings in a much more exciting, dynamic campus uh, feel, really. So I think there's a big, big drive, I think, to, to go towards this, that support those specialist spaces just off, off not sort of next door, if you like. Uh, I think, finally, the other one is, is using the external campus uh, a bit better. I think, depending what, if, if certainly if you're in a rural sort of campus like the University of Surrey or the University of Warwick, um, you, you, I think there's a better opportunity to use the external spaces far, far better. I think certainly in the dark days of the first sort of lockdown, you know, that social distancing, you know, we were having to be taught outside and we don't have that beautiful Mediterranean climate. So I think it's utilizing the, the outside space where there's a well-being benefit, but there's also a health benefit where you can continue a bit of learning and collaboration outside. But also we were seeing uh, you almost want these to be almost digital free contemplation areas. I think you almost had a huge amount of digital overload. There was, you just needed to be away from Teams, away from Zoom, or not contactable. I think it was, there was a real um, feedback of people being burnt out of just being digitally overloaded of, of, of their lives. So I think it's utilizing these external spaces and just a place where you can just get a breather, to turn the phone off for a bit and just, just regroup before you, you 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 get back into into that sort of um, digital world again so i think there's an opportunity there we, we, we think um so just to conclude i think the pandemic provided us all uh, the, the whole world that gave it that big push that it needed to, to really test uh the technology and it and it, it's proved that it is genuinely possible now to remote teach remote learn and to remote work it's not perfect and it's not for everybody but it but you know we've been talking about it for a number of years we now know that it can can work um so i think it's a clear of not throwing away the good bits but obviously it's fixing the bits that 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 don't quite work or improve what 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 didn't quite work as well as it should do so i think a few bullet point summaries i think it's retaining the good elements of of the technology in terms of talking to each other but improving that hybrid experience so people in 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 the classroom have just a great experience as well as the people sitting somewhere remotely so it's a much more seamless and collaborative ex, uh, uh, environment um reutilize your old spaces so the old staff bases the old sort of offices traditional didactic classrooms and lecture theaters these are the spaces that we could i think repurpose into much more flexible exciting uh, sort of collaboration, sort of dens and neighbourhoods, just to really support those specialist research facilities that are nearby. And talking to those again, these are the these are the engine room of the university. This is the core business model. You know, these are why you want to go to that particular university, and that's why you want to stay on campus. So I think we need more of them, and to create them will be more dynamic and more exciting to to do that. Um, we touched on the social collaboration space. I think these are just you know these are your modern take on on, on the library and, and, the, and the students union really i think it's having rather than big big centers across campus it's having much more of them but smaller spread across the campus so there's a much more dynamic lifestyle community across across the whole campus rather than particular areas um and and yeah that, that touching on that external sort of in, in doing the external um, um, campus remodeling a bit more and utilizing a bit more, more appropriately um that's me. I didn't want to talk too much longer, but I um, hope you enjoyed, enjoyed the, uh, the slides. Great. Well, thanks um, very much, Mark, for, for your presentation. 
Um, just a quick question before we move on to uh, my last talk speaker. Um, I mean, you talked a lot about the sort of the way things are changing and the need for more collaborative spaces for students and so on. Are university clients, in your experience, sort of embracing this, or is it you just seeing this from the sort of student side alone? <laughs> At the, at the moment, it's early days, I think. With the universities that we're talking to, they, they are actively looking at, at doing these types of these, these types of changes because I think um, they understood during 2020 and 2021 that the student experience, the student offer, wasn't as it should be. Um, obviously, everyone is coming back to the university now because they want to get back onto campus. They want to experience that that lifestyle, but. They all, a lot of universities now are looking at clever ways on how they can make it more fun, more dynamic. I think we now know that we can work and learn much more agile. So the idea that you've got to go to a classroom to be taught something or a lab or somewhere else, those spaces are still required. But I think there's a better understanding now, actually, you can take some of those components and put them in a more softer environment, whether it's like your Starbucks coffee model or, or a nice sort of sort of nesto that the, that the university of surrey has produced where students can can still learn collaborate with technology but they do it in a more relaxed sort of calming calming manner um so i think i think what some of the work we're doing with the not the universities is looking at how we can repurpose existing spaces within existing buildings to you know take away the old staff office and turn it into sort of community or student hub areas you know, rather than your big hub buildings, they always want two or three hubs per floor on one existing building. So they, so you're creating sort of micro neighbourhoods um, that, that support the big labs nearby, but then students can come out and congregate nearby and, and continue that conversation that they've learned in the lab, but in a more softer environment than just outside. So I think it's coming to answer your, your, your question. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Mark. So um, we now move on to our last speaker, um, who is Helen Gross and Atkins. So over to you, Helen. Thanks, Tom. Let me just share my screen. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to the beginning. Right. Okay. So um, it, it's always hard um, being the third speaker of three. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much to, to Matt and Mark um, for setting the scene so well. Um, uh, my name is Helen Groves, I'm an architect director at, at Atkins and I lead the education group. So I cover everything from um, nurseries right up to um, right up to universities. Um, and it's interesting, you know, taking the time on an event like this, taking the time to reflect and to say, look, what is what is really changing? What's you know, what's sticking from the pandemic um, and the benefits that that's bringing to us? So um, in, in a nutshell, if if, if I had to uh, create in one phrase, the lean, green and more on screen and, you know, the pros and cons of that. So obviously, you know, pre-pandemic, the, the, the drive to decarbonise was, was already there. Um, and it's important that um, it's accelerated that and it's allowed us to look at things differently. And mainly because we are on a drive to use space, use less space and to use it better. And by doing that, obviously, being able to um, to actually acknowledge the changes that that brings us, you know, the opportunities here at, um, at the University of St. St. Andrews. This was this was a pre-COVID uh, project that we did, but the, the opportunity to bring um, all this is non-academic staff um, into a purpose-built space to free up um, quality space in the centre of town and to be able to use this in a more dedicated way um, and to, to free up and actually make more uh, better utilisation of the space that was within it. So we've just got to be a bit careful that um, you know whilst universities are one of the uh, the, the, the most varied landowners in terms of you know campus, non-campus, but also in terms of the type of um, uh, space that they own. You know, um, apart from local and central government, there is no other um, organisation in the UK that owns this variety from residential to labs to offices to classroom spaces to you know everything else. Um, and we must make sure that we don't get uh, swept down the, 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 the single uh, plug hole of decarbonisation being the only game in town, but the wider sustainability, the student experience, all the things that, uh, that we've been talking about already. 
And that kind of takes us on to the, the, the more immediate reaction to the pandemic, you know, the to be or not to be on campus. You know, you look, uh, you look on the left, you know, we're, we're, we're creating lots more social, softer, living room type spaces, um, study centres. Um, and yet on the right, we've got um, a, a load of uh, individual staff offices which are being used I mean, at, at a guess of utilization less than 10%. Um, and, and we simply can't afford as, um, you know, as, as a collective to have spaces that badly utilized. So to be able to move the thread from more from the left you know, and take over the right and to actually be able to use those in a more efficient manner, um, it's how do we bridge the gap between the students who are clamoring for um, the face-to-face -face contact and the staff that have had two years of saying, well, I can meet you on Teams and it's going to be absolutely fine. How do we bridge that gap? How do we create spaces where the event is so powerful that we actually are able to bring people onto campus because they want to be there, not because they're, they're obliged to be there? And that's, I think, the focus of less, better, more focused, more targeted. Um, and in, uh, in conjunction with the, the, the management of the estate uh, to actually create that excitement and to create the spaces which are the, um, essentially the, the, the spaces where the special can happen rather than just more humdrum. And I think that the on-screen is interesting. We've, we've all battled hard to, uh, to make this happen and I know we would have a very different uh, conversation um, if we were all in the room together, I, I, I can just see that the number of attendees in just under 100 so that, you know, if we were in a room together, we would be having a different conversation. There are pros and cons. And yet I can I can show you uh, slides um, or we can talk in a, uh, in, in a more uh, intimate way on screen than we would otherwise be able to. Um, so. I think we're all accepting that, you know, the, the image on the left, you know, the, the traditional lecture theatre, we're moving away from that. Um, there's still a way to go to actually achieve the degree of integration where I feel I am in the room with you if, you know, if I were one of the person, uh, persons sitting there as opposed to one of the persons on screen, how do I make sure that the experience is similar? And I think one thing that we have to be very mindful of is that this is the big change from five years ago. All these different spaces up from the top left, which is the, the, the kind of one to one Carol type space right through to the bottom right, which is the kind of big TED talk, you know, um, uh, global integration stage, um, which all occur at different levels on campus. They all have screens now in a way that they never did before. Um, and so to be able to say it's not just about lecture theatre or classroom. It's now about all these different variety of spaces, um, you know, from the, uh, the, the hybrid flexible lecture theatre to the kind of one to one to the tech desks to the uh, project spaces, you know, all of those which traditionally um, occurred as, as non non screen events. Now all those screens are integrated and to be able to diversify a campus to, uh, to, to make sure that all those activities can happen at different scales as well. Um, will be, uh, you know, will be vital. Um, so I've just got a warning saying my connection is is not great. Um, um, I, I can hear you loud and clear, Helen. So um, yeah, please please carry on. Can you on. see my screen? Yes, yeah, indeed. Can you yeah, see no. my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I I now can't, which is uh, slightly problematic. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so. How do we how do we actually draw those together? You know, it's not just about space because remember all those vessels, which are places that people can be. Um, it depends on whether it's undergraduate, it's postgraduate, whether it's academic, admin staff. You know, you've got a variety of people to deal with, and the activities that take place within each of these rooms is diverse. It depends on you know who is doing what. Um, obviously, the, the 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 physicality of the buildings is important. So, you know, the dimensions of the rooms, the location of the site, and then how much technology has been able to put into them to make that successful. And also bearing in mind that the, the kind of operational approach, you know, who is who is coming on to site? Is it is it a regular, you know, everyday chat that I have um, with with my with my colleagues? Is it a kind of once a week uh, tutorial that I have uh, with a lecturer? Is it um, the 
big lecture with an invited guest that's coming in so that you know who is actually coming in and how do we make that happen and of course how do we get there the final piece of the puzzle on the right is how do we actually get there what's the commuting it's all very well on campus universities where people can just uh, with students i should say can just be there but obviously for academic staff for for those who don't live on campus it's a it's a different way and that engagement and making sure that people feel um excited and plugged into that is is what we need to bear in mind so i just wanted to reflect on how we you know how we actually bring all this together the scale of all of those things that we need to consider in terms of off campus on campus there is of course to the left of this little scale uh, on the screen there is um the global you know um, effect um, or the global influence i should say and that does have a big uh, play on what uh, what decisions universities are making you know who do they want to attract post brexit how does that you know alter the um the demography of of particular university so we need to be able to analyze all of this almost in one and that's a huge challenge for universities they need to know exactly what's going on in each individual space the utilization but they also need to have another eye on exactly the, the, the macro level, the, the other end of the scale, to say, um, you, know, what is, uh, you know, what are the people that we're trying to attract and how do we make our mark and, on the kind of global scale? So how do we measure you know, those things? What are those things that we're actually trying to, uh, to, to understand? So if you think about um, the data that we can collect, um, how that influences on carbon, and I've put that as its own bit of data because it's so important as a kind of moral stance um, and the moral obligation of what we can do. And how we can use, I know the word digital twin is bandied around, but how we can do that in a really simple way to help universities actually understand what they're doing. So I'm sure you've all seen this before, you know, data is the new oil, you know, it's the one thing, it's the commodity which we can trade and use and because we can get such an accurate um, reading of things, it's, it's the power um, in the university's hands to be able to make the decisions and to be able to, uh, to adapt and roll with the punches, you know, whether those punches be decarbonisation, whether they be COVID, whether they be obviously the changing effects of technology. There's so many different things which need to be measured. Um, I'm sorry, I'm clearly having real technical issues today. Let me do that again. Um, another level is, you know, what's nearby? The things that universities can't actually influence. You know, this happens to be Victoria Station, but... Uh, sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Oh, there we go. Um, in terms of uh, the influences on uh things outside the, the university boundary that will influence how young people and academics um and admin staff actually want to integrate their day there's also things about you know where do people want to live how do we actually take on board you know what do we expand which parts of, of, of if it's a multiple campus university how do we make sure that that is you know taking into account where people can afford to live um we can analyze all this data and we can put it in a bigger map we can look at this is, this is one of the tools that, that, that we have and we use regularly to understand, you know, everything from, you know, flood maps to road noise to, I mean, this, this happens to be, um, you know, ancient woodland, um, which perhaps less useful, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but, you know, all of that to be able to understand the impact that we're having. And also at the scale of, we now have the power to really understand what people need, think, um, you know, both psychologically and physiologically within the space, some that we've been measuring for ages, others that we know have a huge impact, like biophilia, like interactivity, particularly to, uh, to, to be able to be aware of mental health um, and designing to make sure that we create the best possible spaces. All of that data is now measurable. We've also got things like, um, you know, sensors, um, all of those elements, so some, some of them are, are um, are physiological, which we've been measuring for ages, and we can now measure in much more detail. Um, and we can also um, use some of that uh, way of working to actually understand the decarbonisation potential of the universities. Now, all universities are on this journey. Um, this happens to be the, the Atkins way of doing it, which involves um, you know, benchmarking and then road mapping and then delivering. But this can never be viewed as a standalone element. It's really important that it becomes 
um, you know, part of the bigger picture. And if you can't put those layers on top of each other, then we're not allowing universities to make the right uh, decisions from what they have. So this, um, I suppose, in summing up, is how do we visualize that? Now, we've been working with a number of universities, this happens to be um, uh, University of Plymouth, um, about visualizing their occupancy levels in space, in, in their individual rooms. You know, fantastic. It's not a BIM model. It's built up from, um, you know, uh, Grasshopper and various other very clever um, people's calculations and coding. Um, but actually, it created something which is a, it's a gamified view. But actually, what we've been doing um, since then is talking to a number of universities to say, right, you can see this, but if we can wrap on top the student satisfaction and we can wrap on top the building condition and we can wrap on top the utilities use and the carbon footprint that a particular building has, then that allows you at the macro level to make decisions for your campus, for your university, um, to be able to see all of those different um, elements together. So we know if a building is a red, 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 then actually that's where you target your effort. But actually, since we first started this conversation, the most exciting part is that we're now able to look at the micro level and say, right, the activities are changing within the tech, the, the, the space typologies. Um, and we're out now able to look at a much more granular level to actually understand the provision that universities can bring to their students. So it's not just the traditional divide between we have some social space and we have some learning space. The fact that you can blend all of that together and actually create a much more unified picture um, of what universities can provide for their students. And um, in that, to be able to provide a, a, a vessel, a receptacle for all of those exciting spaces um, and exciting events which are now taking place as the world recovers and as universities are are facing a, a whole new challenge and a whole new brave world um, and it's it's an exciting world to be part of but the more we can analyze that data the more we can bring it together into a visual package the easier it'll be for that decision making to happen and those are my details um, i'd be very happy to carry on the conversation with um, with anybody who wishes it Great. Well, thanks very much indeed, Helen, for your presentation. Um, and that concludes the formal presentations. Um, so we we'll now sort of discuss some of the issues that have been raised. And I invite the audience um, to submit any questions you may have for our panel. Um, so um, first question I really wanted to ask is all about space utilisation. And there's two angles to this. So the first one is, I mean, I appreciate, Helen, the sophistication of the tools that you use can really sort of get an understanding of all the different factors um, when it comes to assessing your space needs. But at the end of the day, I'm guessing that there are going, there's, there's going to be quite, maybe quite a lot of empty space out there. So that begs the question is, why don't universities just get more students in? Why don't they just expand the student numbers and they get more money in and then they can um, do much more? Is there any reason why not? I think it's, it's the bigger picture, I would say. You know, um, Universities aren't ivory towers, you know. Um, well, you know, in in the best possible way that that they're, they're not. They they exist in the real world, um, and where those young people um, eat, sleep, um, you know, socialize is a really important, um, you know, part of that world. Even if they house all their first years on campus, actually, the impact that that growth would have. Now, we did take a rather tongue-in-cheek look and said, okay, so what if you doubled up? What if you did the Airbnb style? Um, a colleague of, of, of mine and I did a presentation on this uh, last year and said, right, why don't you utilize, you know, fill up the holiday times, do an Airbnb style university and actually get people just for the courses that they're in. Um, it kind of got the feeling that people aren't quite ready for that. Um, but I think it's, you know, it, the simple answer to your question is I think there is there's too much knock on effect on the rest of the infrastructure around them. Right. But, I mean, but if you were to ration, if you had a phased program, so you could um, rationalise the space and the way you use it over say, maybe a period of years, you then maybe get you get, you know if you do that efficiently, there's certainly a possibility you may end up with sort of extra space then, which you could either use to get extra numbers or conversely, one a question someone actually asked is, could universities sell this space to sort of um, help their budgets maybe? I, I, think, I think that certainly the 
Sorry, Matt. Go on, I was, I was going to help you there, Helen, just to give my thoughts on it. I what mean, I think... Um, anyone, everyone chip in. So. Yeah, I, I think you know, in some cases, universities are taking on more students. And I think one of the challenges in the pandemic was how, does the, how do universities manage what they think their student numbers are going to be? And some took optimistic views, some took pessimistic views. And I think when the pandemic started to come towards the end, um, universities then had the second question was, well, how many students are now going to come and do we have the right space to suit the right requirements? Because we were living in this kind of hybrid world of, you know, reduced uh, numbers on campuses, you know, um, the, the various measures that were put in place to, to keep us all apart. Um, and I think that was the kind of second part of the challenge. And now the third part is now we're coming out is what does the next five to 10 years look like? And I think going back to the first part of, of, of uh, as I raised, is every university is different. And therefore, every university is looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, some are looking at growth. Some are looking actually at improving or changing the dynamic of their students, whether that's changing the number of international to national students, whether it's changing subjects or departments or faculties. Uh, bringing in new courses because there are new courses that are evolving as you know every year um, and then you have to question you know do you sell your parts of your estate and I think the answer is, is some universities do because either those buildings aren't in the right location or they're not given the right type of space um, others are saying well we have a campus it's contained within a in a in a city or a, or a fairly tight boundary so how do we actually optimize the space either going up or out or changing the internal arrangement so that you can then respond to larger groups because larger groups of students have very different types of spaces as Helen was was, was talking about earlier. So I think it's always an evolving um, uh, picture. It never stands still like, you know, the whole of our lives don't ever stand still. And I think that's always the challenge that that we have to design buildings that work now they work in five years time, they work in 20 years time. And actually, if we're gonna hit the sustainability agenda, we have to be designing buildings that last a lot longer than 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and we have to look at the, the, the life cycle of our buildings. Um, and I, I think that, that that's what I would add to that question. I mean, universities have sort of, I think we've had, a, correct me if I'm wrong, we seem to have had quite a sustained boom in university investment in, in campuses. We've seen sort of whole campuses reconfigured. You know, I've been to some really quite amazing sort of university buildings, um, which have cost a lot of money. I mean, are those days gone now? I mean, do you think we've got the boom days are over and it's kind of consolidation, more using your space more efficiently, obviously adapting to changing needs? Is that where we're at now? I suppose I'm sure Helen and Matt will add to this, but I think certainly the, the experience we're seeing on some of the universities we're working on is, in, in short, probably yes for the short to medium term. I think just before COVID, I think the the sustainability agenda was was really getting right at the top of, of, of all the universities' agendas, and I think that the just just the perception of building big shiny new buildings wasn't giving out the right message um so i think universities even before covid hit um, were already looking at their existing estates and asking themselves the question should we make better use of what we've got whether it's a fundamental repurposing or light scale refurbishment the mood and and, and, and transition was definitely going towards a use what you've got better rather than let's just keep building big new faculty buildings um, all the time. So I think COVID's come along and it's it's added that, that level of, of complexity to it all. But I, I think the fundamental message is still the same. I think actually, rather than expanding, creating nice new big buildings right here, right now, I think there's a much genuine opportunity uh, that, you know, that COVID has given us with the use of technology and with the way that we're all started to use space differently, let, let's let's sweat the asset that they've already got and use those far better um, before we jump straight to the idea that we must build a nice big building um, and that'll solve all our problems. 
and I do think that the you know the moral imperative of decarbonisation you know I do think um, universities are are really taking that seriously they're understanding the power of that they're understanding the power that that can sell you know because uh, new undergraduates are looking for that they're looking for sustainable uh, places and they will they will use that for their decision making um, and so whilst yes it's important to have um, you know, exciting spaces and, and, and pleasant spaces for those young people to be in. It's also about um, creating something which is, you know, the light footprint. Um, and I think people realise that. Um, I think certainly think students realise that. I think the challenge then is, is um, not so much the students, but the staff is to say, will I get, you know, if I'm, if I'm kind of waiving my research uh, grant um, and I demand this, you know, are we going to make sure that people um, understand the balance there? Um, and the state departments obviously do have a big say in that, but you know, there's something very powerful about a professor with a research grant demanding new space. So I, I think we, you know, th there'll be lots of different um, hurdles um, to, to jump over, you know, in this new era of, of decarbonisation. And you know, speaking of decarbonisation, we're sort of seeing huge rises in energy bills. Um, you know, talk about businesses sort of just closing down because of the costs of energy. I mean, is that are you seeing any of that feeding through to the work that you're doing? I mean, obviously, decarbonisation is a kind of long-term thing, and that's going to help. But in the here and now, is that sort of are, are you seeing very quick universities having to make some really quick changes to cope with this? Are you seeing any evidence of that in any of you? I think um, the, it's part of the bigger um, both environmental sustainability of, of the campus, but also the financial sustainability of a campus. And I think, you know, the, the universities for a number of years, you know, they run more like businesses and therefore, you know, things have to stack up. Um, I don't think we've seen any knee jerk reactions, but interestingly, I think what was considered to be sustainable five years ago and, you know, the reliance on particularly things like gas, CHP and um, some of the big campus wide infrastructure projects that were put in that are now considered not to be the right move. I think there's been a lot of shift in terms of what is considered to be the right approach. And I think, you know, there are universities at different stages like businesses are at different stages in terms of that evolution and that understanding um i think certainly utilization and, and that's not in the last few years i think that's been you know really prevalent for a number of years um and the existing estate and i think that wasn't thought about you know it was all about new buildings and how do we make them how do we make them sustainable whereas actually the bigger issue or as bigger issue is their existing estate and i think that's you know the three of us are all talking about reuse of existing buildings and i think that is a big drive now and and what we shouldn't forget about is that is the student experience and it's not about just how can we cheaply reuse our existing buildings it's how do we make our existing buildings even better than we could make a spanky new building and and that i think is the challenge coupled with we don't have the big budgets in the next couple of years. Some universities still do have fairly large budgets, others don't, but it's working with the budget to maximize value to get the student experience right to also then pick up the decarbonization, which is the bigger, which is the bigger issue. And I mean when you when you're looking at existing buildings in the university estate, I mean are they I mean it's a very big question is but are, are there any um are they particularly difficult to sort of change to meet this new sort of agenda or are there certain buildings that you kind of easy to adapt are flexible perhaps in the beginning um and other ones which it's very hard to do anything with and maybe universities might be better off losing those i think that depends on their building so i think a lot of universities are doing an assessment of their existing stock to to, to answer that particular question thomas i think you know, there will be existing buildings that are beyond their natural life and there's, being honest there's not much you can do with them so you can spend a lot of carbon money to try and 
make them better, but even the finished product will still be nowhere near as good as maybe a new building. But I think that, that's what's going on at the moment. I think it's assessing across the whole campus um, the, the grade, the quality, the sustainability elements of each each building. So, so an, an informed sort of rebuilding or, or, or repurposing strategy can can be developed, and that will that will depend on on the individuality of the building or space accordingly. I think there is, um, you know, historic buildings like you know the listed stock, um, you know, pre nineteenth century, is you know is a challenge for universities because very often that's the kind of front cover of the prospectus or you know it's it's the 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 authority given or the gravitas that you know that that brings to university is important and yet the spaces within them because they're load bearing walls because they're whatever they might be you know are, are inherently inflexible, um, and yet. You know they can't and shouldn't in many ways get rid of those buildings i think the ones which we are now um re or, or finding kind of new love for are the, the mid-century buildings you know the idea because they were built very robustly they were built you know um, often in a framed manner um but you know very often with uh you know a bit on route with you know root list um you know tendencies um and the idea that actually those can be reinvigorated and lifted back into the you know the, the 21st century to create some really amazing spaces i mean you know there's there's so many different universities who've, who've done recent refurbs on particularly libraries tend to be a you know something that falls into this category um and there's some beautiful examples you know in in, in leeds and in essex and in, in, in other places where um they've been completely re you know uh, transformed and, and reconfigured and reinvigorated um I think some of the later stock, the kind of 70s and 80s stock, the combination of the lightweight challenge, you know, in terms of the, the decarbonisation, how you find new life in those, I think is, you know, is 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 going to as as that stock of buildings reaches the end of their natural life, I suspect they're going to give us more of a challenge than than previous generations. Thank you. Um, I mean, sort of, I guess we're getting near the end of this now, but a sort of final question. I mean. Um, you know, we've seen quite a lot of change, haven't we? And obviously, in the early days of the pandemic, everyone was talking about ventilation and we've got to ventilate more. They changed the building regulations that improve ventilation rates. And now, I don't know, it seems a bit sort of like, you know, that's, we've kind of moved on from that. And we're talking about now about hybrid working. Um, do you think it's possible that, you know, we've gone from solid working from home to hybrid working, that we may actually end up reversing back to how things were before the pandemic and that we'll see more and more face-to-face -face teaching and interaction um, in universities and actually a kind of you know embracing this hybrid model might be perhaps in retrospect in a few years time on state i think you i think um it needs to return back to an element of physical um in-person environment just like the work environment outside of the higher education sector has come up with an environment Helen touched on it earlier when you're remote it's a very different relationship to when you're physically in the room with people and I think the student experience is not just about the taught learnt environment it is about moving from a home environment into if you like there are certain the adult environment and even with mature you know, students, it is about an immersive experience. Um, but clearly, as Mark touched on earlier, there is the ability to use technology to um, save the amount of time we spend traveling between one environment and another, and certain elements can be done uh, remotely. Um, but I think we're already seeing a shift back to you know, physical on-campus, in building learning and university life and i think that's what students want um in 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 the most part so i would say the hybrid will enable both but i think it's going to be more physical than than remote it's a value Hello? for money thing yeah wow. it's a value for money thing and, and it's a it, you know what what am i buying um you know as matt was saying i've got i've got an 18 year old who's off to university tomorrow um, and, you know, she was like, 
her biggest concern was how much you know she didn't call it contact time because you know <laughs> we don't we don't use kind of you know the technical terms at home um but she was like you know how much how much time am i actually going to be with 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 colleagues with you know with lecturers with others you know and that was um you know even though she is going to be on campus she is going to be in in, in university accommodation it, it's still very alive to them you know that it doesn't seem real even though they're the generation, obviously, who, who you know, who were taught through Teams lessons and all of that, um, you know, doing their GCSEs and A levels, um, they they see that as an anchor that they really want to go back to. So, I think the challenge is is not the students' desires, is as I touched on earlier. I think it's it's actually the academics and how do we make it as exciting and viable and and worthwhile for them to come in, um, and you know, and to be part of the event um, as it is for, for the students themselves. Thank you. Um, well, um, unless anyone else has got anything to say, we're, our hour is up. It's flown by. It's been a really interesting session. And um, I'd like to thank um, our three panellists for their expertise and time and the audience for um, you for listening. Um, I believe a short survey may flash up on your screen after the webinar is finished. I'm asking you what you thought of it, and I'd be grateful if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill that in. So um, that's it. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Take care, everyone.